All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another 4FAR webinar. Today, we are going to be talking about seagrass and seagrass habitats. Seagrass is an incredibly important part of many shallow water coastal ecosystems. So today we'll take a look at what makes seagrass so important and go over a couple of key features, as well as taking a look at a few of the few main species we see around Andros Island in the Bahamas. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into the presentation. So to start off, what is seagrass? That's a good question. Well, seagrass is what we call an aquatic angiosperm, meaning that it is a flowering plant that lives totally in the water. Seagrasses are actually the only true flowering plants that live in the ocean, and they evolved from terrestrial angiosperms or land-based land -based flowering plants way back in the Cretaceous period. And despite their similarities to terrestrial grass, like what you might have growing in your front yard or backyard at home, seagrass is not a true grass and is actually more closely related to lilies than any other plant on land. Now we're gonna take a look at some defining characteristics of seagrass. There are a few key features that make seagrasses pretty unique and help distinguish them from other plants. The first of these is that all seagrasses have roots and rhizomes. These help stabilize the seagrasses in the sediment and their roots act just like any other plant's roots do, but rhizomes are a little bit funkier than normal roots. There are a number of terrestrial plants that also have rhizomes, and these are basically just horizontal stems that are underneath the ground, as you can see uh, on the image in, in the image on the left. These rhizomes provide a connection between adjacent shoots of seagrass and allow nutrients to be shared by them. They also account for the majority of the below ground biomass of seagrass. Seagrass also has leaves similar to terrestrial plants, but they're a bit different. We call them blades and they're not, we call them blades and not leaves when talking about seagrass, but that's still where photosynthesis occurs like in most other plants. The blades stem up from the outer sheath and the sheath is where new leaves are formed. When the seagrass sea grass flowers, the flowers will also stem out of the sheath. Seagrass beds can develop into extensive meadows over many decades, spread by both seeds and propagation via the rhizomes underground. Knowing these morphological features and how they differ and can be varied is an important part in understanding the differences between the main species of seagrass, which we will go over in just a little bit. So another relatively common underwater plant is algae, and sometimes it can be a little tough to figure out if you're looking at seagrass or algae. And there are a couple of key differences here that can help you determine which is which. The first of these is that looking at the roots area of the plant, you'll see that seagrasses have complex root structures to help anchor them in the sediment that they're growing in, whereas algae just has simple hold fast anchors to attach them to hard substrates like rock or dead coral. When it comes to these next two differences, they're a little less visually obvious, but still very important. So photosynthesis is limited to the leaves or the blades of seagrass and no other part of the plant but in algae, all of the cells are able to photosynthesize. Minerals and nutrients are transported to the rest of the plant using veins in seagrass, uh, and they acquire these th through their environment via their roots. Whereas with algae, algae is able to diffuse minerals and nutrients straight from the water column and directly absorb it. Finally, Seagrasses reproduce like a lot of terrestrial plants using flowers, fruits, and seeds, and algae use spores to reproduce. Now, despite all these differences, algae and seagrass often actually share habitat and can coexist relatively well in some cases. In most seagrass meadows, you are usually able to find at least a few species of algae also growing. Algae presents itself in a very diverse range of morphologies that are pretty distinct from seagrasses, as you can see in these images here. And some species are even calcareous, which is not an ability that any seagrass species, ha species has. In addition, there are some species of microalgae that can live on the blades of seagrass and act as epiphytes, which is pretty cool. Seagrasses are generally found in either tropical or temperate seas across the globe, as this image on your screen shows you. They need 
soft sediment to grow in and stable salinity levels. But beyond that, they're pretty hardy as far as aquatic plants go. They are found in most areas besides the polar areas and can tolerate a wide variety of temperatures, but that temperature does need to be stable. They can't really live properly if there's large temperature fluctuations. Uh, and this means that they can even be found relatively deep underwater if the water is clear enough. Uh, and some species can be found uh, to a depth of 200 feet or 60 meters. In these places that seagrasses are grown, seagrass have a few more requirements to allow them to grow happily and comfortably. The first of these requirements is clear water. Seagrasses require some of the highest light levels of any plant group, so shallow, clear water is a must for the most part. Most seagrass species are found in water that is 10 meters deep or less because of this light requirement. Light has a tough time penetrating deeper water, and seagrass can only survive to down to 10% of what the light levels are like on the surface. And this high light requirement means that seagrasses are also very sensitive to changes in water quality as increased sedimentation can mess with light levels and impact how well the plants photosynthesize. Seagrass also have habitats with low nutrient supplies. Now that might, might sound a little counterintuitive, but areas with low nutrient supplies uh, do not support algae very well. And when algae is not able to grow very well, it cannot dominate the area and choke out the seagrass. So seagrasses actually live in relatively nutrient uh, poor areas for the most part. Finally, seagrasses need some form of protection from physical disturbance. So this could mean living inside of a barrier reef in the lagoon area like we have on Andros Island, or it could mean growing in a little bit deeper water where the wave action isn't as strong for some examples. Now we're gonna take a look at the reproduction cycles and variations that seagrasses have. So seagrasses can reproduce in two ways, sexually and asexually. As far as sexual reproduction goes, seagrasses operate in the same way as all other flowering plants on land. The plants produce flowers and transfer pollen from the male flower to the ovary of the female flower. This pollen is stringy and clumps together, which helps it be more productive and travel better to other plants and other flowers underwater. Seeds are then dispersed in the water currents. Most seagrasses produce flowers of just a single sex on each individual, so usually there are separate male and female plants, and this helps improve genetic variation, because when you're growing all together in a meadow, that can be tough to achieve sometimes. Seagrasses, however, also reproduce asexually via their rhizomes. So we talked a little bit about the rhizomes earlier. There's a good image of the rhizome on the bottom left of that image there. The rhizomes can send up new shoots of grass from underground, and some seagrasses can even reproduce by broken off fragments, settling in the sediment of new areas, which is really cool. So there are 52 different species of seagrasses globally, and three of those we have in the Bahamas and around Andros Island, where Fort Far Field Station is. Meadows are made up of multiple species, and they vary from fast-growing colonizing species to slow-growing persistent species. So this image on the right here goes into a little more detail on that and the differences between those types of growing seagrasses. But today we're just going to keep it simple and take a look at just the three species that we have around Fort Far Field Station. The first species of seagrass for today is shoalgrass. So shoalgrass has slender flat leaves or blades that are very narrow and end in a three-pointed tip as you can see on the right there. This makes it really easy to identify the species once you get up close to it because that three-pointed tip is very distinct. Shoalgrass is also a pioneer species because its roots and rhizomes aid in sediment stabilization, which helps prompt the succession of climax species. It also does not grow well in areas already dominated by another species of seagrass because of this. The next a, a species of seagrass we're going to take a look at is manatee grass. So manatee grass looks pretty similar to shoalgrass until you get up close to it. And it has small, thin blades like the shoalgrass, but they're actually cylindrical and almost have the same shape of spaghetti noodles, if you can picture that. And they do not end in that three-pointed tip like the shoalgrass. 
This species also acts as a pioneer species in the same way as shoalgrass does, and it prefers very, very soft sediment to grow in, things like loose, muddy sand, and this means it can easily be uprooted and it doesn't do well in heavy wave action areas. And manatee grass gets its name from the manatee because this is the type of seagrass that manatees love to graze on. All right, the last species, the last of the three species we're going to be taking a look at today is turtle, turtle grass. Excuse me. This species has broad, flat blades and almost always has three to four leaves or blades on each shoot. Each of the blades is about one foot in length and ends in a rounded tip. This is the species that we see most often around Andros, and it favors high salinity, higher salinity water than other species of seagrass. Unlike shoal grass and manatee grass, turtle grass is a climax species, and it gets its name from being a favorite food source of the green sea turtle. There's a really good image on the right there of a beautiful turtle grass meadow right around Fort Far Field Station. So seagrass is incredibly important to the ecosystem, not only as a food source for things like manatees and turtles, but also as habitat for a large variety of species. Crustaceans like crabs and shrimp, along with polychaete worms, live in the sediment held in place by the seagrass's roots and rhizomes, along with other benthic organisms living on top of these sediments. Grazers like turtles and manatees, along with predators like large fish and sharks, live throughout the seagrass meadows, and epiphytes like microalgae live on the blades of seagrasses. Sea there are a multitude of microhabitats within each seagrass meadow and all harbor a very diverse and rich cast of organisms and edge effects similar to those that we see in terrestrial forest ecosystems are also present as you know you start to move away from seagrass and into sandier areas. Well, as I just mentioned, Seagrasses are not only food, but can be places to find food for larger organisms. Tropical seagrass sea grass beds are among the most productive ecosystems in the oceans because of their high levels of biodiversity and also because of how much primary production is going on through the grass itself. So these are great places for juvenile fish and smaller organisms to live and spend time in, which is why we tend to see larger organisms hunting over and in the seagrass meadows. Seagrasses are also really important in reducing sediment in the water as well as wave action. The blades of seagrasses physically dissipate wave action, which helps protect the shoreline and prevent erosion in the long run. And their roots are rhizome, their roots and rhizomes, as mentioned before, do a great job of stabilizing and holding sediment in place and reducing the amount of resuspension of that sediment and the movement and having it being deposited somewhere else. Seagrass also promotes deposition or, you know, the physical trapping of passing sediments with the roots and rhizomes. So as that sediment is moving through the water, it tends to settle in the seagrass and the seagrass will hold on to it, their roots. All this combined means that without seagrasses, water quality in the ocean would diminish very, very quickly. So they are very important for maintaining stable uh, water quality in throughout the world's oceans. Nutrient cycling is another incredibly important thing that seagrasses do for the oceans. They produce and release dissolved oxygen into the surrounding water and sediment. And the grasses also pass along nutrients as the plant has absorbed, nutrients that the plant has absorbed through its lifetime when the blades fall off and dissolve, breaking down into detritus. Dead roots and shoots become available for consumption for other organisms this way and nutrients are passed along throughout the ecosystem. Finally, and arguably most importantly, seagrasses sequester massive amounts of carbon dioxide. In, in some cases, it's up to 10% of all carbon found in the ocean is actually stored in seagrasses. So when seagrass beds get uprooted or seagrass habitat is destroyed, this can be incredibly harmful for the amount of CO2 that re-enters our atmosphere. Seagrass is also very useful for humans in a number of ways. It's a great uh, insulation source and really good for soundproofing. And a lot of people will weave thatched roofs out of seagrass. It can be used as fertilizer and help grow your crops and almost as a, a living compost. It's also a great packing material. You can stock, it's a good stock feed and mulch. 
and it has some pharma pharmaceutical uses as well. And similar to the insulation, it's also a great thing to stuff in upholstery, upholstery and mattresses because it holds heat really, really well. Now, unfortunately, seagrass is very threatened and has many threats, both natural and anthropomorphic, but most are unfortunately human caused. Things like physical damage from boat propellers and anchors create scars in meadows and beds, along with ripping up the seagrass and over sedimenting the water around the seagrass beds. Coastal urbanization, where seagrass habitat coincides with city and port development, as you can see uh, on the picture on the top right there, this puts seagrass in the path of boat traffic, increased traffic and dragging operation, dredging operations. And all of this, again, increases the sediment in the water and rips up the seagrass over time. Excess nutrients from sewage and agricultural fertilizers can stimulate algae growth. This is called eutrophication. And this means that the seagrass is now going to have to compete with another hardier species, the algae. And it also means that there's less oxygen in the water because the algae is now taking up so much of that oxygen. Finally, overharvesting of the animals that graze on the organisms that encrust and feed on seagrasses can allow pests to take over entire meadows in some areas. So in the Bahamas, a really important uh, species is the conch. And when those become overharvested, they can't keep up with eating these pests that like to grow and eat on the seagrass. And this becomes a major issue for the seagrass beds. So this image here is a good example and kind of explains a little bit nutrient pollution, which is another big risk to seagrass beds. So at high nutrient levels, seagrass ultimately becomes replaced by algae and epiphytes will begin to grow on the blades. And this means that they're not as good at in taking in sediment and dissipating wave action. So the water turbidity increases and the algae in the water column will be continue to become thicker. Seagrass's ability to photosynthesize is challenged as nutrient and algal levels increase and the system eventually becomes dominated by the macroalgae, the microalgae, and the phytoplankton that thrive in that kind of environment. And as the seagrasses die out, the sediment becomes less stable and that in continues to create more turbidity in the water. So it's kind of like a domino effect once you start to lose those seagrasses, you start to see more algae, you start to see more turbid water, that water quality is going to continue to go down. But there is hope. There is hope. So there are a lot of projects right now and a lot of successful projects involving seagrass restoration. So there are three main methods of seagrass restoration. You can see all three of them on your screen here. Micro propagation is when you clone seagrass plants in a lab and you can create hardier species and sort of genetically modify them to take advantage of stronger traits. And these plants that are grown in the lab can then be outplanted back into meadows or in a new suitable location to start a new meadow. For transplantation, this involves collecting seagrass rhizomes and shoots from an already existing meadow. And then those are transplanted in a new location where the conditions are suitable and the water quality is right and all that stuff and those rhizomes and those shoots will start to grow more seagrass in a new area. And the final method is seed-based restoration. So large quantities of seeds can be delivered remotely to the seafloor in good looking areas where seagrass will most likely want to be or was at one point and is no longer there. And this enhances the scale of seeding and improves the ability to restore locations that are difficult to access as well. So maybe in a little bit deeper water or if it's really shallow water and it's tough to actually get some transplants in there, seed-based restoration is a, is a great idea and a great project. So the Smithsonian 10 project, Forfar Field Station was fortunate enough to work with the Smithsonian Institute on a seagrass sea, sea research project from 2018 to 2019. So the research question for this project was how do environmental gradients, light and temperature, influence grazing and nutrient effects on seagrass structure and function? So on the right, the little greenhouse is where Fort Far Field Station is on Andros and that yellow pin is one of the seagrass sites. 
So seagrass is very sensitive to high temperatures and the plants drop their leaves as a response to stress. So these end up on the shore in the summer as temperatures increase. So the Smithsonian wanted to take a look at turtle grass and there was an, an extensive network of 13 different sites across the Atlantic. They're all pretty much centered around that yellow pin that you see on your screen there. And I'll go ahead and, and put this link up and give you guys a second to copy that down if you would like. There's a lot more information on our website on a blog post about this Smithsonian 10 project. It's really, really interesting stuff. And I highly recommend that if you're enjoying the webinar and maybe a little bit more interested in learning more about seagrass, seagrass restoration, you go ahead and take a look at this website or the link to our website. All right, so I'll give everybody just a couple more seconds and then we will go ahead and move on. So that is going to be the end of the presentation for today. I'm gonna to go ahead and see if we have any questions here in the chat and maybe give people who are watching a second or two to maybe ask a question if they have a question. But I just wanted to thank everybody for tuning in and hope everybody is enjoying their Friday. I know where I am, the weather's beautiful, so I'm excited to get outside and get some work done outside. I am not really seeing any questions, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Again, thanks everybody for tuning in. Please be sure to like the video, share it, comment. Margaret says, hello everyone. Thanks, Margaret, that's a, we got one comment, there we go. So yeah, like I said, thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope it was informative, and if you have questions, feel free to leave comments or reach out to us through social media and on our website, and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks everybody.